Do you want more? I don't hear if you guys want more. Did you guys enjoy it? All right. Okay, moving on, ladies and gentlemen. It is that time of the day when we have another interesting panel discussion. And the panel discussion that we have now is the celebrity fireside chat. For the same, I'm going to invite on stage Mr. Anand Desai, Thai Mumbai President and Managing Partner, DSK Legal. Can we have Mr. Anand Desai on the stage, please? I request Mr. Anand Desai to kindly join us on stage. Do we have Mr. Anand Desai in the room? Okay. Okay, sure. As I mentioned earlier, this is the Celebrity Fireside Chat, powered by DSK Legal. Of course, uh, we will quickly have uh, Mr. Anand Desai, Thai Mumbai President and Managing Partner, DSK Legal. Of course, with him, since it's a Celebrity Fireside Chat, we'll also have two more members who will be joining him. We're going to create a little bit of suspense and just wait till these people join us on stage. I, and we shall shortly have Mr. Anand Desai on the stage with us. Please bear with us just a moment. We're going to have him on stage quickly. And as I mentioned earlier, our next session for the evening is Celebrity Fireside Chat, powered by DSK Legal. For the same, we have on stage with us Mr. Anand Desai, Thai Mumbai President and Managing Partner, DSK Legal. We also have with us Mr. Sovik Banerjee, Vice President, Tata Industries Digital Initiatives, advise you to the group. I guess he'll be joining us later. Of course. Ladies and gentlemen, it gives me immense pleasure and honor to invite on stage. I see everybody's looking at me like, hoo, 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 hoo. It gives me immense pleasure to invite on stage Mr. Siddharth Roy Kapoor and Ms. Vidya Balan, Bollywood actor. Let's have a huge round of applause and welcome Also, we have with us Mr. Brijesh Singh, IG Police, who will be joining us on stage. Let's welcome Mr. Brijesh Singh also. Mr. Singh, could you please join us on stage? Good evening, sir. Pleasure having you. Please. Please, please. Good evening, ma'am. Pleasure having you. Good evening. Please do have a seat. Thank you very much. Please have a seat, sir. Thank you. Over to you, sir. It's a bit of a mix and match panel. I'm sorry about that to the participants on the stage. But uh, thank you so much for coming, Sid, Vidya, Rajesh. I think the opportunity I saw when I could find a way to flip the channel was to involve Rajesh's expertise in uh, cyber law, cyber crime, with some of other film industry faces, and may face even more going forward with 4G and uh, other such stuff coming up. Sid is an entrepreneur. He has built with uh, Ronnie Screwwala UTV. He was managing director of Disney India, and then decided, for good reason, I'm sure, to become an entrepreneur at this stage of his career. I think it's unusual, after having held a job in a multinational of this uh, size and scale, to move down that path. And I will ask you a few questions as to where you see it going and what you would advise others as well going forward. Vidya is, as we all know, a very famous, successful film star. In my opinion, in a way, an entrepreneur as well, because one thing I'm going to ask is the roles you've done, many consider unconventional as opposed to normal uh, roles actresses do. Brijesh, I've known for many years and genuinely believe is one of the smartest people I've met. He's been the police. When I first met him, he's IG 
plus he holds a role for the state government, which I just learned about. So if I can start, Sid, with you, the obvious question, which I'm sure many people have asked you, and I'm sure you've formulated at least one answer, if not more, over the years, <laughs> as to what will make you shift and where do you see this uh, going? And I know you love films, and that's a logical way of looking at it, but to have your own risk appetite. So firstly, Anand, thanks for inviting me. Uh, when you said I'm an entrepreneur, I mean, I'm in the midst of a whole bunch of entrepreneurs and who've been entrepreneurs pretty much for many, many more years than I have, considering I've been an entrepreneur for all of three months. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm not really sure what advice I'm going to be able to give this room. I'm probably going to take a lot of advice from it. But uh, I guess on a, uh, you know, on a personal level, it was a pretty difficult call to take. But uh, I think the last three years, um, being the MD of the Walt Disney Company was a tremendous you know, experience. But I think it also pretty much um, sort of catalyzed in my mind whether I was a media guy or whether I was a movies guy. And uh, you know, if you're a media guy, then this is, you know, it's, it's a great company to be at. And it's, uh, you know, uh, there are lots of more steps that you can take in the direction of doing more and more within you know, uh, an, an organization that works across broadcasting, movies, you know, animation, gaming, uh, you know, pretty much every area within the entertainment industry. But I think what I've come to realize over the last few years is that movies is really what gets me going. And I'd like to spend more and more of my time actually creatively developing and producing movies. And I think once you come to that realization, then it's pretty much, you know, the fastest thing that you should do is really get on that path. And uh, hopefully with the experience one has had, uh, you know, over the last decade or so making movies, that's going to hold me in good stead in the future. But it's easy to say that you're an entrepreneur within an organization because we all tend to feel like we are and we can, you know, we take risks within a company. But as you all know much better than I do, um, being a real entrepreneur is very different from being an intrapreneur. And uh, I think I'm going to be, you know, figuring that out over the months and years to come. So fingers crossed. I'm not sure where it's going to go, but I, I hope it gets to a good place. But I guess having been in the industry, knowing everybody, I think you come from a family that's been involved in films. So the path would be more logical and easier for a person like you to get into it than a brand newcomer. Would that be a fair assessment? I think it's fair to say that uh, one has got the access to the right talent to be able to hopefully be making the right movies. But in the film business, it's a pretty binary outcome. So you might, it might be great and you might have access to all the right talent and really still make pretty bad movies. So I, I think what's really important is uh, figuring out whether you've got the creative instincts to be able to pick the right talent from amongst you know, the array that, that, that is available to you. And when I say talent, what I mean is not just you know, the acting talent, but I mean the writing talent, I mean the sort of scripts that, uh, that, that you develop. So you know, um, it is true that uh, it, in theory, should be easier. But I think the most difficult you know, decisions are the ones that you take when it comes to which movies to make. And that can never, you know, that, that does come from experience to a certain extent, but also from instinct. So I've learned over the years in uh, being associated with experts like you that the writer and the script is the main uh, part of a film. And I'd like to ask Vidya that question that when you have chosen roles, it's a risk for an actress or an actor as well. Because one leads to another. And uh, what would dri have driven you, if you can share your experience of picking what other people may have considered very unconventional, and you've done it in a very, you know, successful way. Uh, firstly, good evening, and uh, thank you for having us here. I must say a special thanks, because we don't uh, <laughs> do too many panels together, so this is a rarity. Um, you know, uh, I've never really been bothered by uh, which film has been offered to whom before it's come to me. I really think Dani Dani Pe Likha Hai Khane Wale Ka Naam. And uh, I am, um, you know, I, I need new challenges every single time. I'm looking for something new to do. So if I see that opportunity, then I just jump at it. Uh, so it doesn't bother me that, you know, I have been warned at certain times in my career by people um, who are well-wishers who said, you know, this may not be the right thing for you to do at this particular point of time. But I really think no one can predict what is right and wrong. The in instinct is the only thing that really uh, guides you, um, especially for actors or for any of us in the movies. 
So you don't think that you think differently to other <laughs> actresses? <laughs> um, maybe I do. <laughs> because I've ended up doing things that, uh, you know, like I said, quite a few people warned me against. And then when I ended up doing those films and they did well, people lauded me with all sorts of tags. And I was like, but you know, I didn't even consider it a risk or I didn't realize that it could go one way or the other because the hunger in me as an actor overpowers every, um, I think just um, my ability to even sense risk. <laughs> So really what I'm understanding is that when you take up a project, you're so passionate, you make it work. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's not just what comes to you, but what you make of it and yeah. how you convert oh, it into something I that think that's uh, is the joy, that's a you great know? learning, I think. When there's great content that's offered to you and then you feel you can, you know, own it and you can give it some sort of shape as an actor, you can bring it alive. I think that's the, that's the challenge that drives me. And it's worked well. Sometimes it hasn't worked well sometimes, but I've enjoyed the process every single time. To move on, you know, films are high risk, as we have seen. Uh, there's no formula from what I understand that works. But the bigger issue now is also the leakage that takes place through mm. uh, piracy, through uh, competition even. It's not a leak, but there's so many other forms of competition and accessibility on the net. If I can ask Brijesh first, you know, how would you as a police officer of many years experience and with your cyber law tag, how do you react or how do you see the force reacting to matters such as piracy? Because my own experience has been varied. You know, when there's crime, crime is understood much easier than a cyber crime or a piracy issue. So uh, what happens uh, generally is that uh, police looks at these crimes which are bordering on a civil liability uh, with a different kind of priority than body crimes. So let's say a road robbery or, or murder is much more important in the eyes of police traditionally. Uh, and also uh, the kind of metrics which are used for projection of loss that every one uh, you know, torrent downloaded is equal to one person not going to a movie. So probably that does not work. So the losses which are estimated may not be realistic. Uh, but all said and done, uh, in fact, uh, certain states have gone ahead and uh, yeah. <laughs> certain states have gone ahead and like Telangana has gone ahead and created an anti-piracy unit. In fact, you'll be happy to know, uh, I can announce it here, that Maharashtra government has uh, decided to, f to form a new anti-piracy unit. Uh, which would uh, be headed uh, by us at Cyber Maharashtra. And um, we are in the process of, you know, uh, uh, going through the design of uh, uh, all kind of hardware software that we need for this. But there is a great emphasis and Motion Pictures Association of America is tying up with us to, uh, you know, uh, look forward how we can take this. But, but one thing I don't understand is that uh, industry is very particular about uh, showing that it is losing, but it doesn't show the kind of seriousness which is required to stop piracy. So when MPA came to me, I said, look, you want a unit for this, why don't you, you know, uh, spend for this? Now, nobody's ready to spend for this. If you really want a unit, which would, uh, which would in your own terms, prevent piracy and result in, uh, you know, uh, saving of money for you, so why don't you invest in it? So though uh, I, I'm looking forward for collaboration where the industry comes forward, and helps us to set up this unit both in terms of knowledge uh, and both in terms of their priorities. It, I'm uh, looking forward that we can create a unit which would be a model for all the other states. So by way of information, and I think Sid is smiling for that reason, some years ago the MPAA had tried to pull together producers in India. I was sort of part of that story for some time. And the conclusion we reached was each producer is bothered about his film release Beyond that, he loses interest. So if he has one film every two years, his attention goes up for that period and goes down again. And you're absolutely right. I think and the fragmentation has been discussed many times, but maybe, sir, you can comment on that, yeah. because that becomes an industry issue. And I think we've got people here from, say, NASCOM, which is a very successful organization for the software industry. The first thing I'd like to say to Brijesh is that I think it's an excellent initiative, and thank you for doing this. And on behalf of the Producers Guild of India, of which I'm uh, like sort of currently the president, I can commit to you that whatever help and support you need from the industry, 
and I know that you might have heard that many times before, will, will be offered to you. And uh, you know, we are trying to be much more active in this area. It is, I, I think your point is well taken that we, are, we do bemoan the fact very, very often about rampant piracy. But finally, it comes down to which producer's film is releasing which Friday, and he gets activated at that, at, at that point of time and goes into hibernation after that. But uh, whatever support you require from the industry, we would like to extend. Um, we, we had tried it a few years ago, and uh, I think we were probably focusing on the wrong things. It was a hard goods uh, related like sort of activity that was going on at that time. Today, hard goods is a bit less relevant than you know, uh, it, it was a few years ago. Um, I think we also need to tighten our own ships in terms of the amount of effort that we put into ensuring that all the digital service providers that we're providing are prints too early in order to create different formats are, you know, have, have got the proper content security mechanisms built in. But we really do appreciate this. But there's a lot of technology going into it, right from watermarking to, I mean, if, if let us say, uh, uh, there's a hand camera which is recording somewhere, you can exactly point out to the yes. point of leakage where it has gone. Uh, similarly, even for torrents, now there are very good technologies which can track down exactly who is uploading, who was the first person who has uploaded this in time. Uh, in fact, for your Kahani 2, uh, you know, uh, a friend of ours uh, did a proof of concept and uh, they knocked down all the seeds which were there uh, and we have a detailed report on that. So we did it as a proof of concept. Yeah. Wow. And yeah, you didn't know that. <laughs> no, I didn't know that. And because, you know, I was walking through Pali Market uh, two days after the re release, and I saw a DVD there. I was heartbroken. I said, you know, why is anyone going to go into the theater if DVDs are available two days after release? So this is very heartening to know. But the online is a, is a larger problem because uh, for DVD, you'll have to have some point of sale yeah. which can be physically Correct. stopped. But for online, you'll, you'll have, uh, you know, torrents spawning in minutes yeah. and... Uh, and being downloaded everywhere with, with larger bandwidths, with 4G, with free 4G, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> people are going to use it. Yep. And uh, a film can be pirated much more easily uh, than it can be from a DVD. Vera, you know, sorry, just there are two more things that I think we will need to focus on going forward, and we can probably have a separate discussion about this. But I think getting to the ISP level, and because honestly, yes, it is really data consumption, whether it's coming from pirated content or not. So there's less incentive for the ISPs to really crack down on it. But if there's some way for us to be able to give them a list of rogue sites that they need to blacklist, uh, that would be a great, you know, initiative. So, you know, there has to be uh, some kind of a, of, of a uh, gradated response here. So, what, what can be done is that uh, you can't persecute everybody who's downloading it. But let's say if he just gets a message on his computer that your IP is, has been found to be violating these conditions, I think it's, it's enough of a deterrent. Right. Yeah. I think the proliferation and Dangal, as you know, the Friday it released, Saturday it was on Facebook. And uh, I know that there was a high degree of nervousness and, you know, do something and get it off. But it's actually impossible to get it off because people just keep on copying it and it goes on so many Facebook uh, sites and people's accounts, etc. And I guess that's similar to any other form of piracy because advertising also can be so misleading today and it's so difficult to get it off. So I don't know how technology can keep track of it and how the police can cooperate. The other issue, of course, is the cross-border issue. So while Maharashtra may have a view outside in other parts of India, will it work? If it's outside India, the server, what can you do? So see, in, in cyber crimes, this aspect of jurisdictional arbitrage is always there. That uh, whether your rules apply there or not. Or, but with a lot of countries, you have these multilateral assistance treaties, wherein they do honor uh, you know, requests which are sent. And then you have CERT India, Computer Emergency Response Team India, uh, which is a sort of a nodal agency in India which interacts with all the uh, service providers. Uh, and, and you can go to them and uh, if you can present before them a proper case, then they uh, give a notice to a any server which is outside India also and it has to comply. So there is a set procedure for this. Uh, it is yet not fully established, but I think there is redress. Uh, and uh, about, you know, if, if you talk about uh, files being uploaded, copied. So, you know, each file can be hashed and each file can be potentially tracked. And analytics has become very easy today with big data. Uh, I don't think that it is an impossible thing to, to actually block, but it requires resources. So that's what I was saying to the industry, that it, it requires huge resources. And if, we are, if the government is going to, you know, put in so much of money, then it, it's in your benefit to come and collaborate and help us establish. 
Sid, what about monetization of films, given the competition you have on the internet today with faster streaming, all kinds of content, long films, short films, entertainment, TV serials, which is very different to the era of theaters being the one place you could go to, or then home viewing being the second place. And also the audience uh, reactions to full feature films versus small clips, which you can see on, te on a mobile phone easily. Any thoughts on that? No, I, I, I think it's fair to say that what's happening is that we're moving down the US path quite a bit in terms of really the cinematic experience being restricted to the big tentpole movies or something that's really high concept that becomes such a big, you know, sort of water cooler conversation that you just have to go and watch that movie on that weekend. The top 10 movies in India are accounting for more and more of a percentage of the total box office than they used to in the past, which basically means that people are going to the movies, but they're watching, they're saving up and watching the ones that they really want to watch and everything else is either on a pirated you know, situation or they know it's going to come onto television within eight weeks anyway. So I think we as producers really need to pull up our socks and you know, figure out how we're going to be combating that because Hollywood has done it by creating these franchise movies and superhero movies, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, the Indian film industry is also combating the invasion of Hollywood. And I, I, I think it's a good thing because then everyone gets much more aware that they need to step up their game. Hollywood's actually accounting for, it used to be 6 or 7% of the Indian box office, it's today 18%. Which means that, you know, the sort of strides that Hollywood is taking, uh, we, we used to be that one bastion of entertainment where we thought Hollywood will never penetrate because we have our own stars, we have our own, you know, but the Jungle Book last year did 190 crores and only Sultan had, uh, had done more than that till, you know, Dangal came along. So, uh, it, it's, it's pretty incredible when you look at the fact that we are combating things on various fronts and Honestly, and it sounds like a cliche, but the only way to combat it is by just making good movies. That's it. Which is easier said than done. Exactly. <laughs> and also a good movie versus a successful movie may not be the same thing. That's right. No, that's, that's actually a very good point because I have to say, and we've learned this the hard way sometimes at UTV, that we thought we were making a really nice film. But it's not okay for you to make a nice film anymore. It's got to be a film that draws people to come and pay that 200, 300 rupees. So we made films like Filmistan, you know, which we thought was a really lovely film. And I mean, a, you know, a film that we believe was heartwarming, engaging, you know, aspirational, optimistic, everything. But it did nothing at the box office. And today people talk about, oh, I've seen Filmistan on television, I saw it on DVD, but they will not pay that money to watch that film in, in the cinema. It's got to be something that draws you in. Vidya, from a opportunity perspective, I think we've seen a phase for many years in India when film stars and celebrities never modeled for products or services. It suddenly became a phase when almost every advertisement you had a film star. Yeah. It's now again going from what I'm observing down, I think partly the law has changed, but uh, as an actress, where are the opportunities you would see? Acting in a film, of course, is a natural choice, but product endorsements, other Pro avenues? Product endorsements is one uh, huge um, avenue uh, because, you know, you actually end up making a lot more money through the endorsements than you do on films. Um, I'm not talking about, like he was saying, the tentpole films, you know, the economics of those are completely different. but. Uh, today there are, you know, there are lots of actors producing films. Um, they're also now with uh, the web series becoming a thing, a lot of people are investing in that. And that is, especially with Amazon and Netflix coming to India, the kind of money they're offering, it's just staggering, it's unbelievable. Um, as a matter of fact, last week someone was asking me, why don't you want to produce something for them? And I said, I know nothing about production, you know, what am I going to do? And there's one producer at home, <laughs> more, more than enough. <laughs> so, I, I, I think there are many avenues um, that, but I invariably, for me personally, it's acting in movies and endorsements. Just one more question on that mm. possibility. I'm also seeing a trend where Two trends. One is Indian actors and actresses trying to go to yeah. Hollywood. Some are successful. But the second one is also starting their own production houses. Yeah, yeah. And I'm not sure how 
in your mind, that's a conflict versus a smart move because they'll obviously make their own films and produce them, but they'll also be producing other talent, I mean, involving other talent in their films. No, for me personally, I would think that, you know, um, you have specialists doing their jobs. You're an actor, you act, you're, um, you know, let the producer do his job, the writer do his or her job and uh, all of that and the rest because what's actually happening, uh, the larger picture worries me a bit because I think producers are not ending up making money because most of the time actors themselves are producing the films and they take back a large chunk of the profit. Siddharth might be in a better position to make you understand the situation, but I, from my limited understanding, I just so feel that... It's so refreshing to hear an actor say <laughs> this. <laughs> but now you know I'm married to a producer. <laughs> no, but it's, I think it's really skewed. You know, and in the bargain, therefore then, no wonder that there's not much um, happening with the non-tentpole films. Because, you know, people are not ready to invest in the in other films that could provide very good content because you have to uh, pool in all your resources to make those films. And maybe if the smaller films had a slightly better budget, especially in terms of their uh, publicity, just before the release of the film, I think maybe they'd really stand a better chance at doing well and the, the, the economics will get a bit balanced out. So I think, personally speaking, um, if it's just getting your name, you know, um, just getting a producer credit, that's fine. But we should leave everyone to do what they're best at. So be specialized. You know, it is yeah. sim it's a symbiotic relationship. And I think that's how we, if we respect that, we'll be able to go much further than if we're only bothered about filling our own coffers. So Brijesh's entertainment grows as an opportunity. And we see values going sky high. And I think we've seen a lot of... Uh, films, actual physical productions where I know there's a hell of a security problem sometimes because stars come, overseas bands come, there's traffic issues, and I'm asking you as a policeman, I'll come to the technology part later. But this has just become an increasing problem, I think, to manage people and uh, people movement. And I don't know how education can be imparted so people actually learn to behave. I mean, forget about mobbing a star, but even when you go to an event, it's like one crush to get in and a crush to get out and God knows what else happens. So let me tell you an interesting incident. Uh, so 10 years back, I used to be a deputy commissioner of police and uh, uh, Angelina Jolie and Brad Pitt were shooting for their movie, uh, which was uh, on uh, uh, the Jewish journalist who was uh, beheaded by Al-Qaeda. Mighty, Mighty Heart. And they were shooting in, in the Alana High School, uh, which is just near the JJ School of Arts. And something happened. And within minutes, surrounded by 10,000 people, you know, baying for their blood. Uh, I got an urgent call from the producer saying Ki, some situation has happened, what do you do? So we, <laughs> we then, you know, put a fake convoy in the front and whisked her away in my car from <laughs> backside. So this actually becomes a problem. Uh, uh, after 26-11, a lot of shooting was stopped in South Bombay. Uh, no permissions used to be given. So. Uh, uh, not after 2011, after the train blast. So uh, when I came as a deputy commissioner of police, I said that if you have to show Mumbai, what else will you show other than, you know, uh, Gateway and Asiatic Library and Marine Drive? So we started giving permissions. But it, it becomes a huge problem because uh, one star coming out and, and, and people, you know, gather in hundreds and, and it starts disrupting traffic and uh, in fact disrupts all, all kind of uh, regular activity there. It is a strain and burden on police, and police does not take to it kindly because they feel that ye, ye kya roj ka natak laga rakha hai. <laughs> Inki shooting ke karan humko hoti hai. But uh, somewhere we need to balance this out. Uh, I think uh, people will also mature and, 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 and stop crowding and disturbing others who are uh, you know, regular users of that space. Um, but it is indeed uh, an issue when it comes to police because there is an extra burden on resources. And I think when you see what we are seeing recently for Padmavati is another extreme in terms of, I'm not going to ask you a question on that, but <laughs> I'm just saying that also becomes a challenge because it's a very attention-seeking attitude. Everybody knows you do something like this, it'll be in every single newspaper around the country and everybody will know about it. Coming to technology, and as you rightly said, applying technology for situations in the entertainment industry, including cybercrime, which is not only entertainment but other areas. 
do you really honestly believe that today if a person comes to complain about cyber crime there is enough talent training and resources or do we need much more i'm glad you answer uh, you asked this question uh, see realizing this government of maharashtra has uh, come up with a 1000 crore cyber security project so uh, in in the next 3 years government of maharashtra is going to spend 1000 crores uh, on on cyber crime uh, so we have created now one specialized cyber unit per district uh, which which is like 44 uh, there are 44 police units we have come up with 44 cyber police stations which are state of the art so you will get anything that you get uh, at a corporate uh, forensic cyber forensics lab we have given it to them is is just about to be operational so you will be happy to know that places like beer jalna interior dhule i have given lab equipment worth a crore rupees now the natural question comes are they trained but yes we are training our people also and uh, the project also allows for us to hire people at market rates so we are not trying to you know uh, convert our policemen into some kind of cyber forensic expert but we'll be also taking people from market at market rates Uh, so lot is happening this is uh, basically the the forensic side and maharashtra is coming up with its own computer emergency response team cert uh, and a big data analytics platform so this you would see all these developments in uh, in in the next 6 to 8 months the forensic part is almost over uh, we have come up with these 44 labs each uh, one each in district which are state of the art and uh, the big data and the cert part would be in the next 2 to 3 months So it's great to know because a lot of people believe yeah. it, it is fantastic. A lot of people believe that uh, we no disrespect to the police because you know I know many of you well, but it's a waste of time going to file a complaint. And I think the reason I ask the question is it would be great if people actually have the confidence that when they file a complaint, there is an expert, there is interest in looking into it, a solution can be found. And it's a chicken and egg situation. Uh, so. you know if if you look at the larger corporate uh, you know hacks nobody comes to us because they think we can't investigate but that was the situation uh, maybe the situation today also but probably 6 to 8 months down the line uh, if you have a major ransomware attack or a big business email compromise you would come to us you would you would talk to us and we would be able to help you out because we are developing uh, the way with all we are we are we are collaborating with other countries we are uh, consistently upgrading our uh, skills facilities uh, and uh, so so also we are training a large number of policemen so tomorrow when you'll go to a police station uh, we understand that it is difficult for them to understand uh, cyber crime uh, but look at this police also has uh, some 195 other acts you know right from 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 human trafficking to narcotics he can't be an expert on everything but uh, uh, we are collaborating uh, nascom has helped us to set up the first cyber labs we have taken it forward and uh, we are establishing the fortunately but sir the government is ready to pay now and and uh, um, i'll really uh, say that this is a brain child of uh, chief minister of maharashtra mr devend fadnavis he is the one who's pushing the project he takes almost a weekly update of this and he says cyber is my uh, first priority and uh, with such commitment from the government the cabinet has passed a 1000 crore budget for this thing in fact when we went to uh, present our project a uh, lot of people in our police said that you know cyber crimes is just 0.74% of the total crimes right only 2000 cyber crimes are registered in maharashtra every year why do you want to spend a 1000 crores on this so to which our our this thing was that you know 1000 crores would go in a day one single cyber crime will take away uh, your whole uh, the money lost in all robberies and decoities for 10 years is not what would go in a single cyber crime so today reporting is difficult investigation is still more difficult but uh, let me tell you uh, one thing that after one year this won't be the situation good to hear See, coming back to you, Indian films are now being viewed all over the world. I think your releases, the big ones at least, are released pretty much all over the world. Is it mainly the Indian population there you are reaching out to, or do you really believe, like Hollywood has achieved a mass following, that Bollywood has also received, and maybe the South as well, actually received a following in other countries? And if so, where do you see that going? Where do you see yourselves pushing it? So, to be honest, it still is the Indian diaspora overseas. uh we talk about crossover movies but we haven't really had one we've had the lunchbox which i have to say was probably the one movie that managed to cross over to a world cinema audience but the indian diaspora overseas are the ones who want to consume 
the sort of movies that actually we were making in the 90s. They want to consume the Ghagra Choli, Nach Gana sort of cinema. And that is what they miss as far as India is concerned. They're watching their, you know, Avengers and Star Wars and all that, you know, in any case. So we make great superhero movies or we make great, you know, creature movies. That's not what they're coming to the movies for. Having said that, I do believe that in the next few years, there will be directors who are, who do manage to bridge the gap. Because you've got a lot of directors today who've trained in the grammar of Western cinema. So they understand that style of filmmaking. And they're very Indian as well. They, they come from small town India too. So the movies that tend to cross over are the ones that are very unique to the culture from which they come from. Mm -hmm. So you had a crouching tiger, hidden dragon coming out of China. You didn't have some movie coming out of China that was trying to ape the West. Mm -hmm. It was a movie that was very Chinese and that actually celebrated that sort of style of cinema. So I, I think we'll be very well served by trying to make movies for an Indian audience and just organically uh, over time, the movies that get made will start appealing to a Western audience more and more, but we need to push it on the distribution front much more than we are. But also markets like China and all have opened up. Are so many of your films have done well there. Yeah. No, so I, I, I think it's a, it's a great, I'm, I, I have to say that PK was one example in China, uh, which gives you a lot of hope. I mean, it went and did $20 million in China. Now, $20 million, just to give you a sense in terms of uh, scale, uh, the highest grossing Indian film in any overseas market till date, till then, had been PK in the US, which was $10 million. China so was higher than the US. China was higher than the US. Was Tickets, double. Ticket was, sales. Was double. This Tic was ticket, ticket sales. sales. And this was a Chinese audience, because you don't really have an Indian diaspora in China. So movies that resonate in an, so now PK was a very unique film in the sense that it took on religion, it took on superstition, and that probably resonated in China. Uh, a film like Three Idiots. It was dubbed also. It was dubbed as well in Chinese. So there is hope, and I think it will happen over time. So Vidya, one, and both of you actually, one fundamental difference which a relatively ignorant person like me has noticed is that Hindi films tend to be double the length of a Hollywood film. And not anymore. Actually, no, that's not true. I thought they're getting longer uh, uh, now. Lately. Yeah, so are they shorter? <laughs> they're much shorter now, but actually lately, in the past few months, there have been some films that, you know, have been two hours, 45 minutes, three hours. In the past couple of years, we've more or less restricted the films to two hours, two hours, 15 minutes, but suddenly they're all going back to two hours, 45 minutes, three hours, and honestly, I, you know, um, as an actor, I can say this, that I'm an impatient audience. So I can't anymore sit in the theatre for three hours, even for a great film. <laughs> You're becoming like an American or a Westerner. Really. <laughs> yeah, because you know, it's just, uh, I think you, you're used to doing so many different things. I'm okay to unwind for two hours, two hours, 15 minutes at the max. Beyond that, it's a bit of a stretch. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to ask you a last question and then... <laughs> that, that is true. I, I was going to ask that, but then you but said you know, we are getting shorter. I mean, it's so. like what I guess Einstein said about the theory of relativity, right? You talk to a pretty girl for, two, uh, for an hour and it feels like two minutes, and you sit on a hot stove for two minutes and it feels like an hour. <laughs> so if you're watching a really good film, it actually might not really matter. I mean, and if, you're, if the film is bad, if it's one and a half hours, it's going to just feel like torture anyway. <laughs> That's a good point. I'm going to ask one last question then throw it open to the audience. You know, we've had excellent experiences from the courts in the last few years in areas like piracy. We've actually got orders, what is called John Doe order overseas, uh, where the court says wherever they find a pirated material, the police is directed to seize it or to stop it. The first time we got this order, Delhi High Court passed it. I wrote a letter or email or fax to 500 police stations. I think it was one of your films, if I remember right. I can't. Anyway. And I started getting phone calls from senior inspectors saying, what do I do? <laughs> I've got an order saying I have to stop it, but where do I start looking? Because you have to tell me where to go and look. And I don't know how that pans out. I know with electronic uh, distribution or digital distribution, that's easier. But how do the police deal with orders of that kind? You know, omnibus orders like this uh, are difficult to work out. But, but there are various difficulties at the local level. Uh, let us say you see something and, and the police station hardly has place to keep it, keep, keep vehicles and keep, keep its own people. 
and then you have a pile of DVDs or uh, you know some other material or stacked boxes. Where do they keep it? So uh, this has spawned uh, you know uh, middlemen. So there are a lot of these agencies which which take rights from people and then they come and tell the police station that look I have uh, rights from this producer and come and raid with me. But you don't know what he's doing. He's probably gone to ten places and told that you know I'm coming with police, so pay me up. I don't know what happens there. So it, it's it's that way quite murky. And uh, I think some kind of concerted effort is needed there wherein uh, we come up with some kind of protocols where we ensure that these kind of practices don't take place. Uh, but I think more than the physical, I think online is going to be a, a greater danger in the, in the coming future. I'd like to invite questions from the audience unless there are more comments at this stage here. We have, we have two questions. to enter into Bollywood system. It, it's like somebody end up uh, spending his whole life struggling to enter into the Bollywood system. So even if somebody is a writer, somebody has a good startup idea, somebody has a storyline, there is not an organized way or a channel through which we know that, okay, this is the way. Even the prime minister of this country has an organized way of communicating with him. But Bollywood doesn't seem to have anything. So do you have any ideas for people who wants to do something in Bollywood, how to approach producers or how to approach directors, like a unified channel where you know at least some kind of response or reply is. So, you know, I mean, it's a, it's, it's a fair question, but I, I think it's a bit of a misnomer to say that there isn't really a way to be able to contact people if you want to get a movie made, because frankly, the lifeblood of the industry really is hearing new ideas. And if anyone's been close to that, then they're probably not gonna be around very mu much longer. So um, I can't deny that the number of people who want to get a movie made compared to the number of movies that actually get made, that ratio is pretty staggering. But having said that, I'm sure that's the case when you relate it to any other industry as well. I mean, uh, you know, um, studios have got some very structured ways in which you can reach out to them. Not every script is gonna get heard or read, but you know, there, there, there are mechanisms in which you can reach out. And I can only relate it to our own example really at UTV. I mean, we thought we were entering a pretty incestuous industry where, you know, uh, the mantle of producer needs to be handed down from grandfather to father and then to you and only then will you be able to make a movie. And it did take us time to be able to form the right connections and reach out to the right people. But I think the core is in this industry, the good part is that there is no prejudice except for the fact that if you've got a great idea, you're gonna be a star. If you don't, you're not gonna be treated very well. And that I think is great because I, I, I don't think it really looks at any other angle other than what is the idea that this person is bringing me going to be able to do for me. And uh, you know, if you've got great ideas, you've got great scripts, then invariably it'll happen. Sorry? That's, that's what you need to do. There, there isn't really one sort of monolithic uh, route to be able to enter the industry. You, you've got to reach out to people individually. Two more quick questions. Can you just take the mic? Thank you. If you look at the uh, Bollywood industry, uh, most uh, actresses have married the producers than the uh, actors. Reason behind that? <laughs> <laughs> you'll, need, you'll need more number of mirrors at home if two actors get together. <laughs> <laughs> Good answer. So, <laughs> So I have someone funding my mirrors. <laughs> no, <laughs> jokes apart. I just think um, it's very difficult for, um, you know, I actually very honestly never thought I'd end up with someone from within the industry. Firstly, I was not meeting anyone eligible. And secondly, I just thought that, you know, then that's probably, um, this would be the only focus of my life. But thankfully, I met Siddharth. And, He's someone who outside of work has, you know, other interests and it worked out fine. But uh, otherwise, I think it also gets boring after a while. 
when you both do the same thing. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, yeah, Vidya. One last, last question. My name is Mitali, and uh, I have a really important question for you. You being such an important public figure, um, had in, having invested so much and impacted so much in the film industry, endorsing some really important products. My question is, uh, India is a land of it is a land where you have the haves and the have-nots, and uh, the haves are really well off but the have-nots are really struggling, especially the people who are disabled. Uh, we're trying to educate the hearing-impaired industry in India, uh, the hearing-impaired people in India, and uh, I'm part of an NGO called Deeds. So is there any way that, um, you know, like celebrities and the film industry can help out in this movement to educate the disabled and make them financially uh, independent to be able to add to the GDP of our country because they're being left behind. I think where uh, a celebrity uh, would be of use to a cause like this is when they endorse it. You know, when uh, you do a campaign, any sort of campaign, whether print or depending on um, your budget allowance, even if it's an online campaign, where you get a celebrity to talk about this or even do some interviews so you um, you draw attention to the cause, which will, I think, then help you in getting funding for the programs you have so that, you know, um, the disabled can have better opportunities to education and therefore to a better life. I think that's, that's how, because uh, I don't think we're equipped to really directly impact them in, because I, I don't think we're, um, you know, you have to, uh, train, you have to learn to do these things. So I don't think it can be a direct... Uh, are you getting what I'm saying? Yeah, thank you. But the good part is more and more celebrities are actually participating in NGOs, directly or indirectly. That's a piece of information. The gentleman in the red who's poor man been standing for a long time. Last question, then we'll stop. Mike, just shout. So, uh, like, like every organization, there are priorities. And it is, it is uh, uh, you know, with a limited set of resources, you have to prioritize on various things. Right from women's safety, security, to, uh, you know, national security, to management of traffic, to investigation of crimes. I'd recommend you to you sp just spend one day at a police station. <laughs> and, <laughs> I think we all have experiences. I can help you to spend a day. There you are. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Uh, it was really wonderful talking to all of you. And I hope the audience enjoyed the session. Thank, thank you. you very much. Thanks, thank Anand. you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ma'am, before we end this session, of course, ek dialogue to banta hai na yaar. We have to end this with that famous dialogue of Ms. Vidya Balan. Come on, guys. I'm sure everybody knows the dialogue I'm talking about. Film is sirf teen vajha se chalti hai. Uske pehle mein bata dun, meri film ko please chalaiye 14 April ko Begum Jaan release ho rahi hai. Bilkul. Bilkul, bilkul, of course. Film is sirf teen cheezon ke vajay se chalti hai. Entertainment, entertainment, entertainment. Aur mein entertainment hoon. Thank you. Aap baat hai. Thank you very, very much, ma'am. Thank you very much. Before we let our esteemed guests go off the stage, uh, Mr. Desai, if you could please do the honors of presenting them with a token of appreciation. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much for joining us on stage. Yes, sir. Please. So if you could join us at the front, please. And if we can quickly have one group photo opportunity at the front of the stage, please, with everybody.
उसको सेल्फी भी बनता है क्विकली एक सेल्फी लेंगे जो ट्वीट करेंगे सो वी कैन प्लीज हैव एवरीबॉडी टुगेदर थैंक यू वेरी वेरी मच आई नो आई कैन सी दैट थैंक यू वेरी वेरी मच थैंक यू थैंक यू वेरी मच so for joining us say thank you mr kapoor thank you very much ms vidya balan kapoor let's have a huge round of applause for our esteemed panelists who are on this wonderful discussion thank you very much for having uh being present here this evening